Big boys do cry. Anyone here have a pet? Ever had a pet? Pets at home. If you have a pet or you've ever owned a pet, you probably know what I'm talking about. For those of you that don't, large pet store, lots of unique smells. You don't know Kipper. Kipper was my dog. On 14th of September 2016, we went in to Pets at Home. Kipper didn't come out. It was his last sleep. But I'm getting ahead of myself because what I'm here to talk to you about today is a story about me. It's a story about a large chap with a beard crying in pets at home. But it's also a story about stigma and how important language is. Big boys do cry. You can probably tell that's a play on words because big boys don't cry. That's what we've been told. Crying is just for girls, for babies, not for men. What a load of cods wallop, okay? Crying is incredible. And I'm gonna tell you how incredible that is. Crying reduces stress. It improves your immune system. It self-soothes. It reduces tension. It releases toxins out of the body. Why on earth are we told not to cry? Language matters. The importance of language, especially when we're talking about our mental health, is one of the significant th differences that you can make as an individual, to use the right language. Now, the good thing is I'm going to tell you how you can use that right language today. So let's talk a little bit about stigma. Let's talk about one of my favorite sayings ever. Man up. What an incredible way to talk to someone about their mental health. Man up. What do men normally do in the face of anything difficult? We go and sit in a shed. We close the door. We hope that whatever is going on will go away. Man up. Man up originated just after the Second World War. As the NHS diversed into physical health and mental health, we were really good at putting bodies back together again. What we weren't so good at was putting the mind back together again. So instead of encouraging support, we used a lovely term called man up. Another favorite of mine, and you'll notice I'm just wearing socks today. Another favorite of mine is pull your socks up. Wow, how encouraging is that? I'm in the middle of an existential crisis. My mental health is at the lowest ebb, and you're telling me that I can keep my calves warm? Wow. Language matters. As I said at the beginning, this is a story about me. But in order to tell you that story, we have to go back in time. I'm not going to do a Scooby-Doo sort of thing, but we're going back in time. And we're going back to March 2016. The good old days. That was even before Brexit, the really good old days. March 2016. I was at work in London. I had a reasonably high-powered job in corporate. And what happened to me in March 2016 was that my eyes started fizzing, popping. There were shadows in front of them. I was looking at the screen. I just assumed it was because I was tired. I stood up a little bit disorientated. I spoke to my colleagues. I said, I don't know what's going on. They said, go home. I went, what a good idea. I fizz popped my way all the way back to Euston, got on the train, got back home to Milton Keynes, went to bed, closed the curtains, took a couple of days off. I must be okay. 2015 had been a strange year for me during work, 
we'd been acquired, the company I worked for, a large American corporate. And we had been under pressure. What a weird saying, under pressure. Because what we normally define it is as under stress. In stress, stress overwhelm. All of this had been happening to me for nearly a year. But what had also happened when you're in sales or marketing is you get asked to hit targets. Now, we all know that targets, unless you're an amazing archer, are very difficult to hit. And sometimes you're asked to do things that maybe aren't that ethical. So 2015, we were trying to make the numbers look good. April 2016. Oof, what a great time. April's my birthday, by the way. I'm 50 on the 20th of April. But back in 2016, April was exciting for another time because I was getting married in July. I was getting married for the second time. I know I don't look that young. Um, but I was getting married for the second time in July. Really looking forward to it. But when you're married for the second time, it's not, it's not as stressful as the first. And the stress wasn't really over the top. All the other stuff that was going on, that was pretty stressful, but the wedding wasn't. What was stressful was the lump. The lump that shouldn't have been there. My wife Kelly discovered it mid-April. In May of 2016, on the 6th of May actually, the diagnosis came in. It was breast cancer. What? Breast cancer? She's going to need a lumpectomy? She's going to need radiotherapy? This isn't a scene from Holby City. This is, this is my love, my life. This is, we're getting married in July. How, how, how is this happening? But it was. It was happening, and it was happening to us. I fail to mention the fact that we also have five children between us. We're a lovely blended family. I have two biological, three non-biological. We'd been seven for seven years at this point. But what that meant was Kelly had to go on a journey. I was going with her, but I was very much an outsider on that journey. The best analogy I ever read during this time of turmoil, of adversity, was the one of the mountain lion and the mountain where you're being chased up this mountain by this mountain lion. Kelly is incredible. She's amazing. She's my rock. She's my life. She just took this head on. She was yomping up that mountain. The mountain lion was trying to scratch her and pull her down. I was running behind, naked, clapping. That's pretty much what you can do as a support partner. So what we had here in 2016 was the biggest impact that I had ever felt in my life, as well as life, the mortgage, the kids, all of this stuff going on. We got married in July. It was a fantastic wedding, surrounded by friends and family. We had an amazing honeymoon in Wales. As soon as that honeymoon finished, Kelly went in for six weeks of radiotherapy. We'd also booked a family holiday to Spain. I took the four youngest with me. I was all right, when I? Just lovely holiday. But underneath, I wasn't. I was drained, I was empty. I had nothing left. Kelly, in the meantime, was kicking mountain lion butt. She was kicking it in the face. She was hammering it into the floor. And just for the record, even though I have talked to you about Kipper's death at the beginning, this is a metaphorical mountain lion. There was no actual other animals hurt during this story. So there we were as a family pulling together. 2016, the 14th of September, will forever for me be known as Pah. Day. Pets at home. See what I did there. Pets at home day. We'd taken Kipper in for his last sleep. His toileting had been pretty bad and he was 17 years old. 
I was always told, and I know for a fact, that Blue Boy is currently 48 and living on a farm somewhere in deepest, darkest Derbyshire. I was always told that dogs went and lived on a big farm. That's what my mum told me. It was a bit of a shock to me to find that sometimes they go and live at the back of a large pet store in Milton Keynes. As I walked out on the 14th of September, 2016, I stopped halfway. I was there with my wife, with Adam, my stepson. And I started crying. I am not a small chap. I have a beard. Snot, tears running down my face. But I didn't care. I couldn't move. I was rooted to the spot. We talk about fight and flight. I couldn't move. Kelly, my life, my rock, walked back, took me by the arm, took me out to the car. Her tears still wet on her cheeks. As we got in the car, she asked if I was all right, to which, like I'd been doing for 18 months, I said, yes, I'm okay. Thumbs up. We got home that night, and as soon as we went to bed and the lights went off, I cried. Not little tears, huge, racking sobs. I'd cried like I'd never cried before. I cried for Kelly. I cried for my grandparents who I never properly grieved. I cried for Kipper. I cried for my life. And Kelly held me, and I cried. But the problem was, big boys don't cry. Throughout all of this, I'd been hiding. I'd been trying to keep everything covered up. There's an alternative reality where that day, that next day, I went out and got support. I got some help. I spoke to someone. I hope that alternative reality is also doing a TEDx talk today, because I didn't. I went back to work. I endured the stress. I worked extra hard overnight, extra hard at the weekend. I carried on working. If we ignored the warning signs on our car or our phones, like we ignore the warning signs in our body, we'd all be driving around in burning husks of metal and our phones would be Nokia 9910 still. 17th, sorry, 27th of September, 2016. And I know these dates are meaningless to you, but to me, they're very, very precious. That was my D-Day. That was my depression day. 11.20 in the morning, I'm working from home, fizz popping, the banging, it's all going on again. This time, though, it slipped in something a little bit extra. It slipped in a misdirection of my eye. My left eye is now looking over there. I can't even see the screen. I close my eye, I put my fists, I open it, I type an email that says, I can't see, I'm not working, and I hit enter. I stood up and I collapsed. I was on the floor. I crawled over to the sofa, I climbed onto the sofa, I laid there for 20 minutes, shallow breathing, trying to calm myself down. What was happening to me? I called up Kelly, she came home, she booked me a doctor's appointment. In my head, we went there that afternoon. Only during the preparation of this talk did I realize it was two days later. That's two days of which I have no concept of. I went to the doctors, a fantastic chap. He listened to me, 10 minutes went into 15 minutes. At the end of my story, he said, you have stress-related depression and I'm really disappointed in you. And I'm thinking, oh, what have I done? I've upset a doctor. You should have gone to a &E. The overwhelm, the stress, the toxins, the chemicals, the hormones, everything that made you collapse could have done you serious damage. My life changed that day. I was off work for three months with depression. I went back on a phased return. This is corporate. <laughs> phased return lasted for about a month. And then the same things came back in. But worst of all was the bullying, the workplace bullying. Now, don't get me wrong, people weren't beating me up for my lunch money. 
They weren't putting my head down the toilet at break, but they were subtly and emotionally bullying me to make me do things that were unethical, to report numbers that were wrong. As I moved through 2017, I started to rebuild who I was. In the October, I was told I was being made redundant. In April, I was gone. The note on my personnel file said, burnt out, no use to anyone. I was a VP of Europe. I'd been consistently hitting my numbers. But to a single manager in the US, my weakness had lost a deal. The irony of it was, while I was off, the deal was made up. It didn't exist. So I couldn't have lost it in the first place. But I was an easy target to blame because I was weak. You gotta love stigma, eh? At that point, I decided I need to do something. I needed to work, I needed to pay the mortgage. Life went on, the kids were there. Kelly, who I forgot to mention earlier, is very, very much in the clear. We celebrate our seventh wedding anniversary on the 2nd of July, if you want to send an e-card. But what was happening was that I needed to change. I needed to reduce my stress. I needed to think and act differently. I had a huge support network, both in the workplace, ironically. My local team were amazing, and all of them I still call my friends today. But I, this, the greater support team was my friends, my family. And one of those in particular was a, was a chap called Ross. And he had just trained to become a mental health first aid instructor. Ooh, what's one of them? Sounds like a made up job. He invited me onto the course in November 2018. I took that course, as did Kelly. As we exited out, I turned to her and I said, whoa, I need to do that. That was my epiphany. That was my time. That was my awakening. Encouraged by Ross, I signed up as a mental health first aid instructor in the April of 2019. By June 2019, I was and still am a mental health first aid instructor. My recovery had begun. Throughout all of 2017, I had been going out and doing the things that I wanted to do, this time without feeling guilty. I would go bird watching. I would go and lie in the garden in the rain. I would do things that I wanted to do because that was how I recovered. I'm so grateful for the fact that I was able to start that journey to recovery, to have a support network around me. And what I really want you to take away from my particular journey, my particular recovery, is that I couldn't have done it on my own. There were so many people that I would need to thank if I was gonna thank everyone individually. But as I started on that road to recovery, what I realized very quickly was that I needed to help me. That was why I became a mental health and first aid instructor, to help me in 2015, to tell me that it's okay, to tell me that it's okay to cry, to tell me to push back, to ask for support. But I knew that was impossible. I can't time travel. So what I felt I could do instead was help one person. Let me help one person, one person at a time. And that's all it took because there are lots of people out there struggling, suffering. What about if I can just help one person? Since June 2019, I have been so lucky in the fact that I have, through courses, facilitation, through podcasts, through webinars, I've reached thousands of people, thousands of those one people. And what that's meant to me is, is has I've made a difference. I've had lots of emails and text messages saying I helped them to go and speak to a GP. My inspiration, my passion made them go and have a conversation with a loved one. So do you know what? I think I have helped the one person. But the problem is, as we go through life, 
There are lots of one persons. When we talk about recovery, when we talk about hope, when we talk about creativity through adversity, I have a personal mission to help one person at a time, to keep helping that one person, to make sure that I don't miss me in 2015, to tell them it's okay to cry. We always try to end on a high when we're talking about recovery, even though we may not have finished the journey. My high is being here today, alive, to talk to you, and to let you know that if you are struggling, if you need support, if you need help, talk to me. Talk to someone. Someone will help you. Don't struggle. Don't keep it in. One thing I'd like to leave you with before the stage, before I leave the stage today. It's okay for big boys to cry, or big girls, or however you identify. But think about this for one moment. What if we can all help one person? Man up isn't the most hurtful insult that you can throw at someone. It's not the biggest stigma and discrimination issue that's, that's currently affecting the globe. But just think about a society. If we all spoke a different bit differently, if we used different language, what about if all these people that are sitting next to you you could just help them, if you could just help one person. What I'd like you to take away from all of this is that big boys do, should, and can cry. Thank you. <laughs>